Welcome back to AP World History. Uh, we're going to take a look at the Age of Revolution here in these sets of videos. And uh, there's going to be three. Uh, we're going to focus on the American Revolution first. Uh, then we'll take a look at the French and Haitian Revolutions. And then we will take a look at the other Latin American Revolutions that happen uh, in the span of 100 years here or so. And the reason why we start with the American Revolution is because chronologically it is first. And it really sets off. It sets the tone for all the other revolutions that will... Uh, come up out of this. So, the American Revolution. There's a question I have for you before we jump into this, and, and it's a simple one. Was it justified? This is probably the point in world history where now you know a lot more from before in your educational settings with lessons from previous grades that you have an idea on this. And so take a couple seconds, think out was this justified? And then jump back into the video after you got an idea and have some possible reasons. Uh, and see if those hold up throughout the rest of this video here. So before we dive into the American Revolution, we've got to set the scene. And in 1750, this is what the world looks like. Okay, You can see the, the dawn of the empires. Britain's starting to get kind of big. they got India. they got uh, the colonies. Uh, but they're not huge yet. They're not the British Empire that we'll see in the modern era uh, with uh, controlling most of Africa. And so they're just starting to grow up uh, and build up. And France has a pretty big empire, actually much bigger than theirs is right now. Uh, Spain is still the huge dominant force. Uh, but things are about to change. Uh, for Britain, one, but also for the Americas and what happens in the rest of the world here. So, the Seven Years' War, uh, this happens uh, in the 1750s and 1760s and will be the primary cause of why the American Revolution happens. And what it is, is it's the third set in a series of wars between uh, France and Britain and the European powers for control of territories in the Americas and uh, in other regions of the world. And uh, this war actually gets started by the colonists. Uh, they try to keep pushing into Indian territory, and the Indians fight back, and then the French join the side with the Indians, which is why we call it the French and Indian War uh, here in the America, in the U.S. Well, most of the rest of the world calls it the Seven Years' War. And so we have a lot of fighting going on in our region, but it's also a world war. There's fighting in Europe, in Eastern Europe, and there's fighting in um, India uh, over control of that. And this will become a very expensive war and will lead to some problems uh, for the British after it. But they do get a great deal. They win the war. And in the process of the fighting in the Americas, they conquer the city of Quebec. And with that, they gain the territories that the French have in the Americas. And so they gain Canada and parts of the Midwest there that you can see around the Great Lakes. So places like Illinois and Michigan and Indiana uh, and uh, going up to the, it goes up to about the uh, Mississippi River there. So they will gain all that territory after the end of this whole war. But it's going to cause now some strain between the colonists and Britain. Um, the reason for this strain is because for the most part, the colonists have been allowed to rule themselves. Uh, Britain's kind of been like, oh, you guys just do what you want to do over in those colonies, um, and everything will be all right. But after this war, they realize, okay, we've got to kind of clamp down on these guys, make sure they don't do anything stupid like push into more Indian territory and start another war. And they really need to start paying for all the services we do for them, like protecting them with our military and, um, and everything else that they do. And so um, they decide that they're going to tax the colonists. And so they start out with uh, really trying to enforce the Sugar Act, which really just affected imports. And the colonists just ignored it and instead decided to smuggle in goods or continue their smuggling in of goods uh, that were illegal and from other countries, uh, which went against the ideals of mercantilism. And so the British go, well, we're still not making enough money. So they try the Stamp Act. And uh, they put uh, tax on stamps that go on every paper product. Um, well, that doesn't turn out too well. The people revolt and, and burn the stamps, and uh, especially in cities like Boston where there are riots. And so the British go, okay, okay, 
calm down. We'll we'll take a break from that. And then a couple years later, they try the Townsend X, and again, the Colin is boycott and throw a hissy fit. And so um, they back off again. Britain backs off again. But Britain's going, okay, we eventually have to be able to lay down the hammer if we're going to be good colonizers, if we're going to be controlling our colony, which is supposed to be subservient to us. And we just need the money. Our, we're, we're bankrupt. We're, we're going bankrupt from all the debt that we have from the Seven Years' War and from housing troops over in the Americas now. And so they decide that they're going to circumvent the smugglers, circumvent the traders, and also make tea cheaper all in the same stride. And uh, what they do is they set up the Tea Act, which makes tea cheaper. They're going to sell it directly to the people, and they're going to make the profit on it for the East India Company, and then that's going to become profit for the British government. And so that's going to make things better for them, and you would think this would work out. However, again, the colonists protest. As you might know, there's the Boston Tea Party. And before we had the Tea Party in Boston, we also had another conflict known as the Boston Massacre. And these will eventually lead to an act, a series of acts known as the Intolerable Acts, which will lead to the series of events of the Lexington and Concord battles. And those will be kind of the first shots of the revolution, and that sets everything off. Um, but it's all because of these ideals that we have from the 1600s and 1700s known as the Enlightenment that continues through this. And many of our founding fathers here in the United States are considered Enlightenment thinkers. And so they believe they should be able to have that self-rule, or if they're not going to have that, they should have representation in Parliament, which becomes a major um, phrase of no taxation without representation. And so they try to fight against that, and that's their justification for this. And so we'll see. Um, the Declaration of Independence comes out on July 4th, 1776. And then that leads to the war beginning uh, later in 76 and then really going into 77. Uh, the war starts. And you can see here uh, on this map all the battles that take place. Um, Americans win a few battles, uh, but um, there aren't actually a lot of huge and major battles. There are several battles that happen. There's a lot of fighting that actually goes on throughout it, but there isn't. There aren't many large-scale battles. The biggest ones are like Saratoga and Battle of Yorktown. Um, and kind of the battle, and the Battle of New York is definitely a huge one there. Those are kind of the three biggest ones and the three major ones. Uh, the Battle of New York almost ends the revolution there with um, the Americans being almost caught underwares or not prepared for the British coming into New York and uh, almost get captured, but luckily uh, Washington escapes that and uh, will retreat to... Uh, through New Jersey and go all the way across the Delaware River, uh, which then he'll cross it back over on Christmas and attack the Hessian mercenaries to boost morale. Um, and that's what uh, Washington does consistently. He keeps the army together, keeps it from falling apart, because that is what, that's all he needs to do. He just needs to play a defensive game, guerrilla warfare style, to win the war. He doesn't have to beat the British in a major battle. Unlike the British, the British need to take out the American army. And so this goes on uh, for several years, goes up until um, in the 1780s until we get to the Battle of Yorktown where the um, American forces along with the aid of the French forces that came and joined the U.S. and also, um, or the 13 colonies, we weren't the U.S. then, but joined the 13 colonies in the fight. Um, they joined it after the Battle of Saratoga uh, in 78. Um, or 77, I can't remember the exact, the exact date on that one. But uh, they join the battle and they help us out. They help train our military better. They give us their navy or they come in with their navy to help us out some. And so they'll eventually entrap the British Army at Yorktown with their navy. And we come in by uh, land um, and we beat them. And that will lead us to the end of the war. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles will be signed that ends the war between us and we become our own independent nation. And so the effects of this will be, one, this is the first successful colonial rebellion. Uh, it'll be a, the first in a line, but it's the first one that does it. Uh, all the previous ones were put down and put down pretty mightily. Uh, but in this case, the Americans are able to, to, the early Americans are able to stand up and, and fight against it and successfully fight against it. Along with that, they create the first 
um, highly democratic government since the Greeks and really the Athenians and the and a little bit on the Romans, but more like the Greeks. Um, and and um, they base it off those Enlightenment ideas. People like Locke, who says you should be able to rebel against your government. People like Montesquieu, who say there should be three branches of government. People like Rousseau, who say there should be... Um, and Voltaire also says this, but there should be freedom of speech and freedom of religions. Uh, and so they base them on these Enlightenment ideals and become the first true Enlightenment nation. And this will then be a guide for later revolutions. One, because France goes bankrupt helping us fight the war, but also uh, it's inspiration for uh, other people in a similar situation like in Mexico and the Latin Americas and South America and Central America and Haiti, uh, which we'll see. And so it has a major effect on those and, and brings about more revolutions. And you can even see still today it sometimes reverberates in the world today with new revolutions that come up. And so the question again is, was the American Revolution justified? Look at the causes, look at what happens, weigh those effects of it. You can look at where we're at today as well, but think about, was it justified? From the American perspective, yes. From the British perspective, not really. Because all they were trying to do was do what any colonizing nation does, which is enforce their taxes after protecting the people who weren't paying for taxes to begin with. And so, just as a different perspective, keep that in mind, that not everyone says the American Revolution is justified. And especially when you look at it from the British perspective, uh, it's looked at more as a civil war than a revolution. And um, that we shouldn't have broken away, that there wasn't anything justifiable. And the idea of having Americans in par Parliament is kind of crazy because the communication time between the two regions is very vast, or is very long and would not make it maybe the most conducive. And so um, that's why maybe some outsiders might say it's not justified.